Okay, Reboot FM, 88.4 in Berlin. So Reboot FM, 884 in Berlin, live aus dem Transmediale. So, again, this is another live uh, little transmission from the Transmediale Festival at the Haus der Kultur in der Welt in Berlin. Now we are starting a new round of discussions, and this is with uh, Reboot FM's very own Pitt Schultz, and he is discussing a few topics with... Uh, John Young and Deborah Nastios, and they are actually the architects of information. That's one of their projects. They do something which is Cryptome Org. I have a hard time pronouncing this, and I'm sure they will correct this. This is actually something which um, is a kind of pre-WikiLeaks uh, archive of of many documents that were leaked that are very controversial, classified or otherwise. And yeah, they have you know. <laughs> oh, I'm just, I'm actually going through that. In the last 15 years, over 65,000 uploads. And it has dis it survived dozens of corporate takedown orders and hacker attacks. And I have to say, Deborah Nastios and John Young are as convinced as ever that all information must be free. I think I'm going to leave that as the introduction. They're quite, I think, renowned figures within a larger community of people that are interested in making sure, keeping governments and institutions accountable and using documents to do that. So Pitt Schultz is going to take it on with my uh, John Young and Deborah Nastios. Yeah. Good evening. Um Can you say something to the microphone to test it? Hello, John Young. I'm here. Good. You hear us, Diana? Good. Hello. Hello Deborah. there. Um, Deborah, you are also an artist, right? And not only an architect. You had an uh, exhibition lately in New York. I had an Cam exhibition in Los Angeles yeah, last spring at the Dem Passwords Gallery on yes. West Adams Street. So before we speak about Cryptom, I think we should take a chance to talk about your art. Um, it's 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 political art, I would say. Yeah. That's how that's as much as I understood. And it's somehow using material from Cryptome or topics about surveillance and the city. But there's also material I found very interesting from Greek uh, history of uh, of migration. So I mean, you are an architect, but also an information architect, so you have a special visual style. Maybe you can just introduce us to your art. Well, I like very much you searching through this bouquet of various titles and role playings, because in fact, it is a, a kind of ill-defined uh, collection of practices that we have that I don't really establish very sovereign boundaries between. We flow very easily from one to the other. We take material and activities and content from one depository and shift it into the other practice. And so it's a continuity. It's a spectrum of practice and activity. So to say artist, architect, information architect, cryptome, licensed architect, licensed by the state of New York to practice in New York City, it's all an amalgam of borderless performance. Mm -hmm. And, and so my visual work, in fact, is very cartographic in nature and of a political cartography, a political geography, very narrative, and a counter-narrative to dominant geopolitical narratives from post-war years on. Exactly. So cryptome figures in that because cryptome's landscape is in that contra-narrative landscape of content that defies uh, strict itinerary state borders and so on. So it's a very interesting landscape of, of constant redefinition and invention. And so every day as we be begin our practice, it's a thrill of the unknown. So you, you, you have both of a background as architects. But you particularly, I found in an interview, have a background in, in intelligence community from the family. So you want to talk about I that? Do. You I want to disclose it here? I certainly do because, in fact, the new work that we premiered at Transmediale on uh, a couple of evenings ago mm -hmm. uh, in the, um, in the uh, Anxious to Secure stream, uh, had very autobiographic, autobiogeographic elements buried mm -hmm. in, which is typical of my work. 
But yes, I grew up in the Cold War context in a CIA family, and we moved. If I list the countries we lived in during the post-war years, you will see a trajectory of geopolitical interest by the Pax Americana. Mm -hmm. And so this is the context of my being in the world during early years, being in a very, being very locally in Greece, Vietnam, France, Korea, the Netherlands, Argentina, Iran, being very locally in situ as an emerging young person, but always with the narrative of the Cold War sort of hovering uh, beyond the domestic uh, perimeter. And there you are, um, having this uh, formidable, extraordinary archive of uh, the how it's called, um, the godfather of um, WikiLeaks. Julian Assange basically took the model of Cryptome and, and made it kind of um, uh, into the Time magazine. <laughs> But... Um, You, you are doing this since the 90s, the mid-90s, I would say. I, I'm, since I'm basically on the web, I know about Cryptome. I don't know, when, John Young, when did you start Cryptome? 1996. Yeah, so we started that time about the same time. That was like a, um, the time where people were still believing in the hacker ethics of um, information has to be free. It was long before open source was called open source probably was known from the intelligence community more than from the hackers community, the open source documents. So you are, you are known to be releasing every day uh, a package of um, highly classified documents, more or less classified, from various um, institutional contexts, um, corporations, internal documents. Maybe you can just start somewhere where you, maybe we can start with Ecolon, because it was discussed here as a source of um, the Snowden discussion, but you can also take any thread you like where you would say this is where the moment where Cryptome started. Well, it started with, uh, with us joining the mail list Safarpox in 1994. And, of course, that's the start of, uh, of Assange as well mm -hmm. uh, on Safarpox. And there are dozens of people who got a start on Safarpox in uh, the the mid-90s, and so it, get, it deserves all credit for what's going on now. <clears throat> so in 1996, we started to publish documents from members of that mail list who had access to documents through their work but did not want to be associated with their release because they saw what was coming with the wind down of the Cold War. This, this technology was going to be released to corporations and was going to be turned into the commercial market and against the public. Formerly, it was only directed at nations. So they knew that was coming because the jobs were drying up in the intelligence services and the contractors, and so they wanted to get this information out there. So they started to give it to us. We had a scanner and a computer, and so we started scanning and putting this stuff online, and they would do it only on the condition that they were not identified. So that was the start. And... Um, oh, One of the nice things about it, we didn't know what this material was. We could not understand it ourselves, but we knew how to put stuff up. And that comes back to um, a predecessor, uh, which I won't spend too much time on, that I personally started doing this kind of work in 1968 at Columbia, and where I first learned about social um, protests and activities parallel to um, your career, in which we set up a group to do this kind of work Uh, to correct our education or to supplement it and to not get stuck into a career path. And so that continues. So Cryptome is an outgrowth of that for me. For Deborah, she has a different origin, but uh, both of us came at it from a particular direction of not wanting to be stuck in a career hmm. or not only there, but to find other ways to engage with the public we were ostensibly to serve. But of course, we found out that we were being trained to serve an industry, not the public. So that, that continues. Mm, that was a time of the Vietnam War, Watergate affair, so and the uh, weatherman. This was somehow your context where you started. That's correct. That in fact, the Columbia Strike Committee, Mark Rudd and others, for a brief period of time was stationed in my apartment mm. when they got kicked off campus. And so that uh, uh, I had a family, a bunch of kids mm. in there, and they came in with their wonderful attitude toward whatever they did. And so it was a thrilling experience to be exposed to young people's enthusiasm 
and uh, the shocking the career path. Uh, and so uh, they took off another direction. We took off into a somewhat more restrained direction because we, the group I worked with did not like high profile activities, did not seek celebrity. We thought we should do public service quietly and not ostentatiously, and we continue to do that. And so that, of course, distinguishes us from another of high-profile people now. We don't like high-profile activities. We think that corrupts the process. And particularly, we learn to distrust the media because the media really trashes the student protest. At least in America, I don't know what happened in Europe where May 68 becomes something of a different uh, signal. So for us, uh, it was important to dissociate the use of media for for one's own mm. personal career. So we've tried to avoid that. Mm. And you you still call it a hobby, cryptome? I mean, in the other talk you said it's a it's a hobby. <laughs> I mean, sixty thousand documents, um, twenty five years later, it's a kind of a serious hobby. Huh? I mean. There are not so many other cryptomes around the world, so um, it's a kind of rare hobby also. And, well, and it needs people. If you don't mind, I'll give like credit to leaking. those who are doing no. this long before us. Yeah. One is the National Security Archive in mm -hmm. the U.S. has been okay. doing this fantastic work. Mm -hmm. You must go to them for really uh, great stuff. They get a tremendous amount of material from the government through mm -hmm. FOIA. But one that's even older than them is the Federation of American Scientists, mm -hmm. which was set up to oppose the nuclear war. Mm -hmm. and the nuclear armaments, and they're still the stellar mm -hmm. group composed of scientists, engineers, and truly responsible people, and they are far more capable than we are at doing this, and now they are funded, they are well established, they do great work, however, they don't like what we do. Mm -hmm. We've been told they don't like what we do. The phrase they use, you go too far, mm -hmm. we say, yes, we go too far. Mm -hmm. That's what we're up to. We want to go where others won't go. Mm -hmm. And that has led to some confrontation with the authorities, but mm -hmm. uh, I think that comes with the territory. We learned that in 62. If you go too far, you will get visited by the authorities. Mm -hmm. You've got to accept that. We've not yet gone to jail, uh, but which means we've not really gone far enough. We think if you don't go to jail for your beliefs, then you haven't gone far enough. However, we haven't gone. Uh, so we're not that courageous. And nor do we want to encourage anyone else to go so far that they go to jail. But we do know disclosure sites that would encourage people to go that far. They never go to jail. Their sources do. And that's what we got a beef with. We don't think that the media, our lawyers or others who, who milk these sources, ever go to jail. And we think that's unfortunate. I think that is a, a deception operation. Speaking about the sources, um, who are sending you these materials, which are not, before they're sent it to you, they're not part of the public domain. Um, do you have any kind of idea where they're located in, in statistically? Uh, I mean, they're mostly from the U.S., I would say, some international. Well, it's important that, mm. that we get Deborah's view on this yeah. before I get carried away. But yeah. <clears throat> my view is that uh, disclosure should be done extremely quietly. It should not be done ostentatiously. Mm. One is because that separates you from the consumer. Mm. And consumers don't believe high-profile people. They know what they're up to, that they're up to their own agenda, not in the interest of the public. So you've got to do it very slowly and in a way that people can absorb it in their own terms. And they don't need stories to be told to them. And we part company with journalists who think they've got to explain things to the public. We don't believe that. We think that's, uh, that's how it gets corrupted. And so we think that is a con job of people who think they've got to explain to the dumb public what's going on. And so we have no narratives on Krypton. We put up documents. You make of them what you like. And we warn people to don't trust us. Don't trust any disclosure site because they're heavily surveilled. They're recorded upstream and downstream, and we don't have any control over that. And we, we dislike the notion that disclosure sites say, we can protect you. They cannot. That's a deception operation. Media can't protect you. And so we like to poke fun, uh, actually not poke fun, st stab in the eye of these folks who deceive the public about security. And we don't know of any site out there who is truly honest about the, the surveillance, they participate online in particular and on telephone through the architecture of communication. Mm. Every site has log files. Mm. 
If they deny it, they're lying. Those are log files upstream and downstream, and you cannot control that. And so uh, those who don't understand how the Internet works are deceiving people. Those who know won't admit it mm. because it's too lucrative to keep it quiet. So we think that all these um, public service organizations who are supporting Snowden, WikiLeaks and all are not telling the truth about how their visitors are being logged. Mm. They try, but they don't, they don't go far enough, let's say. Mm. So I, we think every disclosure site is, should say, don't trust us. Do not believe we can protect you mm. and see what happens after that. But usually you get these um, documents through PGP, I would assume, from sources who are, you don't know. Also kind of addresses um, you can look up on a PGP server, of course. Um, but in another moment you said uh, that you have a kind of information that a lot of them are coming from a local area, which I found interesting, that there is some kind of local fabric attached, let's say, in the Man Manhattan area, that a, a higher percentage of documents which are leaked on Cryptom are coming from, a, let's say, a local... Um, I, I, I feel uncomfortable geolocating. Yeah? You cannot say that. Yeah? Geolocating yeah. any of this, okay. the origins. Yeah. As far as you know, almost nothing comes from the New York area. You can't believe how dumb New Yorkers are about this. <laughs> so it's not, it's not so New Yorkers. Arrogant, just no, they think no. they're on top of things, and they're not. They're hustlers. Yeah, New York is no, it's, hustlers. It's, it's, it's not local, but I, I don't think geolocating the mm. sources is, is productive, really. Um, uh, I think uh, we have to maintain a kind of geographical new, neutrality about mm. boundaries and jurisdictions and... Mm. and uh, and just uh, accept the, the transaction, a trusted transaction. And I think it's important to repeat what John said about mm. the current corporate media business model of celebrity as a, uh, um, a, a, a an income producer and yeah. celebrity as a sensationalizing, titillating uh, device for... Uh, Uh, increasing the value of mm. of content is, is something we stay away for uh, away from. It's it's deeply cynical to uh, uh, sensationalize this trusted transaction between someone who comes with a document and puts it forward to you. It, particularly as cryptome is mm. a, a, a modest a, a modest undertaking. We we cannot promise, and uh, therefore one has to be. Uh, understated about the transaction. So you're hinting on um, Jesse Manning and... Uh, let me, let me name some names. Yeah. <laughs> There are some ACLU, mm. one of the most corrupt organizations in New York City mm. and around the world. Mm. <clears throat> We detest how they're handling Snowden. They're using him for fundraising purposes. Uh, Meanwhile, they're turning down more needy people because they're not good for fundraising. Mm. Look at what these folks are paid. Phenomenal salaries are being paid. So phenomenal salaries are being paid to the intercept. This is your corrupt organization to get these kind of salaries out there, while others who provide them information are either going to jail or getting nothing. And I think that, that is the, that's the pattern that's going on now under the, the national security realm. Now, I should say, National Security Archive and FAS do not do that. Mm. But some of these newcomers mm -hmm. to the national security field. Mm -hmm. Now, ACLU is an old organization, but we know some people who have left ACLU over this issue mm -hmm. because they become money-driven, not uh, public service-driven. And they refuse to have anything to do with ACLU. And that's a tragedy because it had a, once had a wonderful history. Mm -hmm. Now, the question is, who else is on the list? Well, we think there are some others which we'll hold off for the moment, but there are others who are also smelling the coffee of, mm -hmm. of money-making because they think, well, you know, we've been at this for 30 years. We've got to pay our bills. Well, we've got to put as you know, college. The, the neoliberal model includes the nonprofit world. But the nonprofit world is now in a group think in terms of its operational practices. There are consultants. You get a degree, in, a master's degree in nonprofit 
uh, in nonprofit management, mm -hmm. and they're all following the industry best practices on fundraising and so on. It's very uh, uniform across the board. Whatever organization, you get the same uh, formatted letter on the on the on uh, responding to the same news cycle trigger stories that will generate funding. It's 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 it, it, it's it's part of a homogeneity of of business practice that is uh, qu quite startling. Mm -hmm. But all of these nonprofits who are within a particular tax structure in the U.S. and therefore they have their accountants and tax lawyers consulting them uh, have all had to because of their board members uh, or whoever their fiduciary uh, consultants are mm -hmm. fall in line with these uh, industry practices. Mm -hmm. So it's it's no longer a a voluntary uh, uh, ethical ethically driven uh, but very much a uh, best practices driven in in the fiduciary sense and extremely troubling mm. let, me, let me say the private charity the charity market tell where also now alphabet and uh, bill gates foundation and uh, you know ford and the big ones they're competing with each other in the non-profit sector yeah. this is probably what germany will also have to and face did you with. know that is lucrative tax write-off to set up a non-profit journalism organization. That's why so many are popping up, because they're considered a hardship industry. Mm -hmm. Isn't that absurd? But it turns out Amador saved a lot of money by setting up First Look because mm -hmm. there's a big tax write-off for a hardship industry, as though it's mm -hmm. you know, some, some farmer threat. out there somewhere. Mm -hmm. So when you see Bezos and other people investing, mm -hmm. it's for tax write-off. Yeah. And so a number of non-profits in the media world Mm. Oh, the decline of investigative journalism. Oh, blah, blah, blah. That's the hardship side. Well, it turns out that's the result of heavy lobbying to be declared a non hardship industry. Bingo. And you, but you, when you look at their tax reports, you see what they're getting paid. Tor is one, mm -hmm. another one that is running a scam operation. And so the thing is, is that they have a heavy dose of PR going. Uh, Radio Free Asia, right? Hmm? Radio Free Asia, the Open Technology Fund. Hmm. Hmm. I mean, isn't it the kind of old Cold War um, propaganda, Psy War money going into tour? I mean, can we say that? It's almost all government money. Look at it, almost no private money. Amador has been involved, State Department involved, uh, almost nothing. Now, they ran a little fundraiser recently because they were getting such heavy criticism for being a government operation. And so now they said, well, we are, but you know, what can we do? So when they get exposed, they say, oh, well, you know, this is a real world. Would you stop bitching? I, we know you're jealous. Mm -hmm. And so they've gone through all the cycles of that. And, but then you look at what they're actually now helping FBI break into TOR using the child pornography mm -hmm. excuse. And so one of the Snowden documents said, oh, NSA can't break into TOR. Not true. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, well, I mean, um, I don't know. We are we are very loyal here to, to, to this community because we're part of a network here. But on, on the other hand, some kind of inner cr critique is, is can be also seen as constructive. I think these questions are important to be posed. So um, uh, you can say whatever you say. We are free speech Wait, here. You, you, you know? just said some inner critique could be. You said that very tentatively yeah, and I mean, cautiously. You should say that robustly. That robust dissent within any organization is crucial in a democratic context. <laughs> Don't apologize for it. Yeah. I just try to harmonize here because uh, I'm getting signs here. But, but I think it's, it's very interesting to see, I mean, let's speak about TOR again. And as a, as a kind of where is this, the, the strategy of TOR? As I understood it, in the beginning it was about field workers in a, in a kind of enemy territory to be basically protected. It's classic uh, spy technology. So it was for activists working in a kind of, let's say, in a certain crisis area. In the history of um, clandestine radios uh, communication, to be anonymous. So, and for for that that use case, then kind of kind of because the internet doesn't have borders, uh, 
has a second use for the people in the US or in the West. So, but this is a kind of collateral damage of something which is, was supposed to be in the beginning really for uh, targets in, uh, let's say, China or other areas. Could you confirm that? And, and then you had to create a narrative around it, uh, around cyber freedom and, and all of that. But as a tool for, for intelligence services, it, um, you know, it has certain use cases, of course. So it's an interesting example where um, certain, you know, damages are coming with, um, with certain technologies. And you just mentioned this, some, some, something similar where now the cyber doctrine is um, mixing together the defense department with the attack department of, uh, uh, I think, NSA and from the uh, cyber war. U.S. Army, I think they're kind of starting to reorganize. Maybe you can talk about that in the context of cyber war, that um, somehow Tor is part of that, you know, stack of, of tools. Yeah. So um, we, are, we are weaponizing our, um, our communication also. Yeah. Well, two things that happened in, uh, in this session. Mm. of meetings. One is yesterday we were in a session mm. in which activist was used as a disparaging term. We hadn't heard that since 1968. Rather than it being a term of, of approval, it mm. was a term of disparagement, i.e. <laughs> you're too far out. Mm. We've got to be reasonable and responsible here. Now mm. that, I, I pick up on that because mm. some people use it casually, but that's what I mean about the neutralization of term. For example, surveillance is, is a corrupt term. Mm. You should call it spying, mm. not surveillance. This is a softening term. It's an aggressive, violent act of spying. Even spies use the word for spy. They don't believe in surveillance. This is an aggressive, they said, we break laws. We break into people's lives. We do damage. But the PR people won't say that. And so the thing is that we're adopting the wrong language. We're softening the issue, and that's because we're scared shitless or because we're just mimics, monkeys repeating what other people say. So the use of the term surveillance is corrupt, should not be used anymore. Nor should, or if you use it, say, well, what we mean by surveillance is polite spying in which you don't really harm anyone. We don't do any injustice to anyone. It's all so polite and it's approved. Now, that's why they cooked up the term in Britain to use surveillance or intelligence, which is an even more devious term, for actually creating harm in people's mm. lives. Mm. And so we think something very peculiar is going on now because, as we know, for many decades, no one paid attention to an invented term called national security, which was invented in, what, 1947? Again, as a kind of a, a cloaking term rather than we're going to go out and hurt you in some way. So, yes, what happened a couple of weeks ago is the director of NSA said in a public meeting, we're going to meld information assurance, which is counterintelligence, with intelligence gathering, which is spying. We're going to blend those two. We kept them apart before. Now, what has not been released very much by Snowden is counterintelligence, how you defend against spying. They've raised the alarm about spying, but they haven't said what to do about it. Even today, we're still hearing claptrap about surveillance and Snowden documents, how much they tell us, but they don't say what to do about it except talk about it a lot mm -hmm. and hold debate and go to Congress and hold conferences and write books and give talks and make documentaries, do art about surveillance. But it's all because we can't talk about counterintelligence. We can't talk about what to stop this shit. Well, it's very, that's too classified. That's, that's above top secret. It's very interesting that Ed Snowden in 2010, when he goes with Dell to Tokyo, one of his functions is as a CI trainer, a counterintelligence trainer at a quite high level, he claims, for Chinese, for China counterintelligence. And that, that whole experience of his, that shift into the counterintelligence mode, then precedes the acceleration of him moving towards 2013 and moving from booze in Hawaii yeah, to Hong Kong. Yeah, what we Kong. hear is that the knuckle draggers so spy. That, the intelligent people do counterintelligence. They, they do counter spy. And so they, they send people out to do clumsy work. Mm. You need them to come in? No, oh. no, no. <laughs> she. No, um, no. But this is very interesting. Um, uh, so 
Snowden himself. We will have a big conference in March, um, the Logan conference here, where the whistleblower de debate is con getting continued around um, investigative journalism. And they have a very interesting uh, goal there to um, ask an investigative journalist to collect their kind of unfinished research material and kind of share it, uh, even if it's uh, used or not used, to at least share the background material of investigative journalists, which is one of the practical um, goals they have there. But on the other hand, it will be again around Snowden as a kind of, uh, uh, f let's say, like a, a hero for um, civil rights. But um, it's not being mentioned often enough that he his his job is, is he was part of the intelligence community, so he was a spy. Yeah. So, um, and uh, knowing about, uh, you know, coming from Berlin and knowing from the 80s, uh, the Cold War um, situation of, um, you know, um, Klinikerbrücke, exchanges of spies. There is a certain culture around uh, spy culture, and that's often forgotten that Snowden himself was working in this environment. So, um, how can you trust a spy? <laughs> you know, yeah, you cannot. Yeah, see, you cannot uh, trust. Snowden. You cannot trust anyone who has a security clearance. Right. It's important that you understand they are trained to lie about what they do. Yeah. That's requirement of their security clearance. So one of the campaigns that we need to get going, if I were a community organizer, I'd say is never trust anyone with a security clearance. Mm. Abandon them, don't talk with them, don't socialize with them, and certainly don't ask them to be a speaker or your friend mm -hmm. because they are lying to you. They have to lie to you. <laughs> and so that uh, it's not a glorious role, it's a dirty role, and it corrupts civil society to have people with security clearances. We think all security clearances should be lifted, mm -hmm. and they have no protection for what they do. But let me give credit to several people who've actually done good work. Yep. Winslow Peck in 1972 wrote about his experience with the NSA, one of the earliest ones who revealed what the NSA does. He was a low-level um, person, and he had to come out. This guy's still alive. Winslow Peck was a used pseudonym, and he now lives out on Long Island in New York. And uh, Adrian Chin ran him down a, f uh, a few months ago and got him to talk to him. He did not really want to come out and talk it again because he paid a price for that revelation. But he did. He talked about it. Next, there was a, a woman who worked at, um, in Britain for the NSA and discovered that the NSA was spying on Congress people and revealed it and went to Congress and testified about it. She told a reporter named Duncan Campbell, who's trained as a physicist, really knows his technology, and started to feed him material that he started digging. And he still does. He's, t he's had access to a little bit of the Snowden material, but not much because he's so far ahead of them technologically, they, they can't get him to gear down. And so a lot of the stuff they're revealing, he's already written about. And then in the 1980s, he wrote about it. Uh, Nikki Hager yeah. first revealed Echelon and, uh, and uh, now called Five Eyes. So this stuff has been around for a long time. And then, of course, the European Parliament did an investigation in 2000 for the whole thing. As someone said yesterday the in our Stoa, seminar. So this stuff Stoa is not report. new. It's only new to people who've not been covering it. And they act like it's a whole revelation. The thing is, is, we think a lot of new stuff could come out of Snowden because the thing is that we've been short shifted on the technology. How do they do this stuff? Mm -hmm. Now, Ducklin is dug hard, and a few people have dug hard, but the ordinary reporter can't do that. National security reporter now is something of a, a dog term. It's what you do and wait for handouts. Mm -hmm and have lunch with national security people where they feed you tepid information. And every newspaper now has a national security reporter who never reveals anything except how, what a great job they're doing. But if you talk to Duncan uh, Campbell, Nikki H uh, Hager, who's still out there, still writing, they have stuff that's really quite good. And it's depth, it has depth, it has richness, it's not glib. And they don't give you glib answers. They're getting short shrift right now. Uh, and don't know why Snowden didn't go to someone like that rather than these assholes he went to. So that's a story that hasn't been told yet. Why did he wind up with these completely technologically illiterate people to reveal this stuff to? Someone sold him a bill of goods that you need to make a lot of waves with this. Now this is a so-called Snowden pact that we still don't know yeah, what that he, entails, which yeah, is that he, they advised. get to do what they want to with it. Mm. Well, I think the guy was desperate because <laughs> he'd been turned down by other people yeah. sitting there in Hong Kong, worried, 
Now, wait, let me just say, mm-hmm. this is all based on fairly loose information, but he, mm-hmm. he, it was a hell of a time to get anyone to listen to him. Mm-hmm. And so we don't know who fed him into this group mm-hmm. and why they were so unable to deal with it except in one particular way. Our only hope is he put it with someone else on the quiet, with people who knew better and how to handle it better, and it's being dealt with another way, and that this whole rigmarole we're seeing now is a cover story. So we keep our fingers crossed there's something better happening now Mm -hmm. in the background because that's where it should be happening and not in the front page of newspapers, which is a worse way to find out about national security Mm -hmm. uh, because it's it's dealt with in in a homeland-like way. So you're critical about this spoon-feeding the... the the mass media with um, yet another few documents and keeping the whole thing burning. Criminal. Yeah. It's actually, they're mm-hmm. acting just like spies, but mm-hmm. dribbling yeah, information. It's a, it's a second secrecy regime that's mm-hmm. been imposed now by the media proxies. And the, uh, the assumption that this, there should be a media pathway to the public, well, that could be a fallacy. Mm-hmm. There are technical people in reserve, ready to review serious documents should they be put forward, which they have not been. Uh, Not the occasional journalists, but serious teams of technical, uh, 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 digitally literate uh, uh, individuals who are are looking for meat on meat on the bones and and there's none none to be had at, 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 at this time you know if we're to believe the current media Snowden's current media proxies and his testimony through them uh, he's been extremely cautious and controlling about his release he's wanted to have his cake and eat it too he's been extremely uh, particular about uh, what he wants to be, uh, let go evidently and and what uh, he wants to be kept kept in reserve is it his choice at this point you know those are taxpayer doc tax paid for documents mm-hmm. those are taxpayer documents belonging in the public domain and what authority does he have now at this point where he opened the spigot to now be controlling in a, in a, in a fairly doctrinaire and authoritarian way what happens to this trove, this cache? Well, well, there was a quote by Snowden, and of course we only get quotes from Snowden. We, it's hard to know what he actually thinks or wants done. Is he said, I gave this material to the public. Well, no, he didn't. He gave it to a bunch of self-interested journalists who decided to run a certain story with it, i.e. to explain it to people. And these fucking explainers really have got a problem. It's a serious conflict of interest. They've made themselves, they've written themselves into the story as Mm. heroes, co-heroes of the story. Mm. It's a conflict of interest. Mm. They are are not at a distance from their source. They've uh, embedded themselves in the narrative. And therefore, all uh, all decisions are highly suspect because they they benefit from uh, uh, the outcome of the narrative in in every sense. And you think there are other ways which are also working, they're functional, and you don't need to go the to the mass media. You don't have to do the do it the Hollywood way. You don't have to you know stage and spoon feed and. Dramatize. I mean, there are, there are ways to, to do it scientifically, so to say, right? I yeah, mean, what, uh, they should go to people who can read the documents, yeah. not report on them. Yeah. Reporting is not honesty. It is right. headline grabbing. Mm. It is selling uh, hyperventilation. Mm. And they call it reporting when, in fact, it's highly selective, uh, highly literary in character, f- suffused with ads or nonprofit contributions. Mm. Give this stuff to technicians who can use it. By the way, we're on mail list with technicians. They cannot believe this stuff is being withheld. It says, we know how to build offenses if we could see this stuff. It's hinted at, but they won't release it. And they say, this is, um, uh, when I use the word criminal, they're saying this is criminal behavior to imply that they've got it but not release it because someone may go to jail, it may damage Snowden. These are all old cornards that are just not true. This is a standard ACLU story. We've got to go through legal means. We've got to have our attorneys vetted. We've got to check with the United States government as to whether it's okay. I think these are just tall tales, and they've been around for a long time. I mean, ever since newspapers have been around, it's been around. 
And the thing is, is that there are plenty of people ready to look at these documents, but they just, they're just not given access. And it's, it's a story that just hasn't been written about. Now, a few people have commented on that. You know, there's something called dual hat uh, in technology, people who work both in the classified and the unclassified mm -hmm. area, mm -hmm. in which they can see both sides. But there are actually a pretty high wall between the two. And the question is, how do you do one without hurting the other? There's even something called dual use technology, where it can be used for both military purposes mm -hmm. and for civilian purposes, and you have to know the technology to know the difference. Mm -hmm. There are a number of dual-headed people who allegedly have been given access to this material. Mm -hmm. The thing is, though, it's so damn lucrative to see this stuff in the raw and not mm -hmm. have constraints on it. Mm -hmm. I could name a couple of interesting people mm -hmm. who, mm -hmm. who've been milking it already to, because they, they have been given access. But they're still out there beating the drum for public interest. But you can see already that they're uh, using this to their advantage. Now, that's the corruption side of dual-use stuff. Uh, this, this may sound kind of exoteric, uh, but I think that um, we at least have to be able to talk more about um, how duplicitous the intelligence world is. Mm -hmm. So if you talk to a spy, they're trained in duplicity. If you talk to a media person, they're trained in duplicity. Mm -hmm. If you talk to a professional, they're trained in duplicity. Mm -hmm. We're professionals. We know what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. So we have to think you've got to be honest about when you're being a professional, i.e., a liar and a cheat and a self-interested person, and when you're a true public servant, and be able to make that distinction and not blend them. So I think that the NSA is about to blend the two. They're going to use their information assurance people, who are pretty much the honorable, who, who build offenses, and they're going to corrupt them by putting in the same room with the spies who are... Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so we'll see what happens. And by the way, um, the NSA head said there was resistance on both sides to melding the two because they've got their own culture associated with it. They don't trust each other. Mm -hmm. So we'll see what happens. We have high hopes that it will, what, explode? Mm -hmm. Uh, so, and um, I mean, there are different uh, statements by the NSA uh, about the gravity of this uh, um, rev revelations by Snowden. But on the other hand, you know, after I think now two and a half years, thinking back, uh, the Untersuchungsausschuss in Germany going through its processes, what has been achieved, yeah? what has been done for the public? after so many years and I think the question is allowed to ask isn't the NSA now becoming in in the public eye or in the, the, the mass psychological um, behavior more powerful than it was before I mean in the Clausewitzian sense uh, it makes sense to to let your army look even bigger than it is you know so I mean it's uh, how, how I mean it's it's just an assumption it's just one pos possible um, interpretation but don't you think it would be very good to kind of um, reveal these documents to make sure um, that this is that this assumption is wrong? You know what I mean? I mean, by now it looks that because we, it's so hard to defend, that uh, these tools become almost omnipotent and uh, and and uh, the, the Congress in the U.S. or the Untersuchungsausschuss in, in Germany they didn't achieve very much. In the end, uh, it's, it's basically like a, um, uh, the, the NSA is even winning through the leaking of these documents. They seem to win more than if, if it wouldn't have been leaked, you know. So this, this interpretation is, I think, something which is rarely discussed, but it, it should be also put on the, on the table to say, look, um, we need to get more and much further access to the documents so that security experts can develop defensive um, means. Well, I think you've got a good point because yes. clearly, let's say the first chapter was to present the case to the public, mm. to the in the court of public opinion. Mm -hmm. The public responded or not. Mm -hmm. Now it's time to move into the next stage of the campaign, which is to move into the technical sector. Right. Uh, we see now in the U.S. presidential campaign, there's a huge co constituency for giving free reign to national security interests on the part of the public. The power is coming from below up. Now, 
in between ca presidential campaigns, you don't see the the uh, manifestation of mm -hmm. that interest group to the degree that one does now, because mm -hmm. the media is covering them and their opinions about American power, American militarism, American uh, exceptionalism through military might and prestige. And uh, in certain voting groups, that kind of military prestige is still the coin of the realm in this time of turmoil and uncertainty. They want to see that military, they want to see the NSA have full mm. capability and more. And Snowden uh, only demonstrates that there needs to, so, so that's a bottom up mm -hmm. constituency. Mm -hmm. Therefore, having litigated this in the court of public opinion and arrived at the uh, result that we have in the last two years, it is time to move now into the next, uh, into the next uh, campaign. Mm. But the documents have dried up. The activity is now extremely uh, 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 trickled. To, the spigot has tightened up. And so, um, there you have it. I think there is an official statement from Krypton where you ask for the full release of the documents, if I remember right. Yeah? When, when was it when you asked for the release of all the Snowden documents? Uh, yeah, in fact, uh, we kind of think we got set up by mm. this invitation to come to this session mm -hmm. because we were led to believe that the discussion was be about to <laughs> get an agenda going to get the documents all released. Mm. Well, what we had instead was people talk about how to make the best use of the ones that have been released mm -hmm. and no one wanted to talk about getting more and so we think we got cheated and deceived in a spy-like way we got set up so we like to disavow anything that happened during our participation here because uh, Christian had told us that was a reason that he wanted us here because he had a movement going for that but what it's we not have a so bunch much of people who've got a stake in not asking for and more? it's not so much getting more it's the principle of getting the full yep. collection, the principle mm. of all of that being forwarded into the public domain without uh, the gamesmanship that we're seeing at the moment of the stewards, these media proxies who are stewards of the collection, who are self-appointed in a non-democratic way to, uh, uh, to uh, determine their dissemination. And it's entirely, un their, their approach has been undemocratic and uh, extremely proprietary. They jealously, proprietarily have hung on to this collection in an entitled way that is now embedded in their careers, their prizes, their awards, uh, their personae, their, their, their growing celebrity in the culture, their now uh, museum shows, <laughs> and all the opportunities that have opened for them. This is simply not uh, uh, the democratic model at this point. You know, at first, as they were sharing this with a number of media around the world, <clears throat> no longer. There's only one source now, and that's The Intercept. They no longer share this with other media even. <clears throat> and if I might say uh, some breaking news, I just talked with a guy who's on the inside of that group who said, we totally agree with you that more technical information should be released, but there's going to be little chance of that because now the argument is that that would threaten Snowden's deal with the U.S. government. So now the agenda is to protect him by not releasing any more. Now, we've assumed that was going on. And so the thing is, now what happens to those documents? Because this is a lawyerly approach that we're going to save this guy, his heroic status. We're just not going to release anything more to the public. Mm -hmm. This is deal making. Now, you know the U.S. government would love this idea. Mm -hmm. They'd love to offer some inducements, a pardon, a freedom, and just trash all this stuff. They've been trying to get it back and destroy it. Mm -hmm. uh, and it may be that Snowden now has been shell-shocked enough mm -hmm to concur with this. He doesn't want to go to jail. Mm. Thing is, is that, well, so where's the public interest in this? So he may get a pardon, he may get released. The journalists have made their case, um, got a lot of attention, and the government gets the documents back. Mm. And so what do we got here? Well, they'll mm. say, well, we made a little progress. We'll do better the next time. This is the best we could do. We tried it. So there's a plea bargain going on. Mm. Well, it turns out plea bargains are rigged games. And often what happens is that 
what you do is you gang up on the victim, i.e. Snowden, and say, if you don't do this, you know what's going to happen to your family and your friends and your lawyers and your supporters, and they slowly peel away all your protective people or threaten them mm -hmm. until you're left alone and say, do you really want to harm your best friends? And repeatedly this breaks their spirit. Mm -hmm. I.e., I don't want to hurt the people who've been supporting me. And so, yeah, all these other people who don't want to go to jail say, you can't do this to us. And we're going to save you, i.e., mm -hmm. we're going to save ourselves. So I think that has to be done in public. I think that plea bargaining has to be made public. We would like to see that take place. We've actually asked through FOIA for all these mm -hmm. inquiries. We'd like to see, we've asked the Intercept to make public what they're doing in the background mm -hmm. and not mm -hmm. hide it. Mm -hmm. So that, too, is now part of the, the Snowden disclosure. What are you doing back there? Yeah, the lack of transparency in the process. Yeah. L total lack of transparency. And, of so, course, uh, this, this idea that, well, we've got to work with what we can that came out of our seminar yesterday is a concession, uh, is a concession, concession of defeat that mm. we're not going to ask for anymore. Mm. We'll work with this. Well, I'd like to call that cowardly. Why don't you run a risk of pushing for more and not settle for what you've got? And we saw... We've now seen several presentations of people making much of what they've got. Mm. And they don't want to hear that it's incomplete, deceptive, wrong-headed, exploitive, uh, and uh, cheating the public of, of, of an honest account that these are partial documents. Mm. They're not complete. They may be false. Some of them may be yeah. completely fake. We certainly know some of the classification markings are fake. Yeah. They don't do that anymore. That's not how they classify documents, by putting it at the top. Mm -hmm. Those are deception markings. They do it other ways. They're buried within the uh, document itself, within the file, within the paper document. So they seem to say that because this has its classification marking, this is top secret stuff. Not so, true. So, so you say probably some of the slides were fabricated? Yeah. Probably. Because spies put out fabrications all the time. Yeah. That's a counterintelligence operation. Exactly. You do not put out everything you've got to anyone. And you mark everything in multiple ways, mm. including the easy-to-discover ways. Because that's how you entrap people. They think they swiped it when, in fact, they've just pointed a finger at themselves. Mm. But some uh, of, and so that's but why I say some, these folks are it, not yeah, familiar yeah, with how yeah. devious spies are. Seem to be naive about this for some reason. You refer to some discussion on cyberpunks and from the security um, community. Bruce Naya, for example, said something like that before. That I mean, a lot of the. Uh, to name a few, Uniper or Cisco routers are um, compromised to have known backdoors. Probably some of the do documents in this Snowden stash hint on that, but they're not getting released. That's in the interest of the security um, community to get access to this material and validate it and research it. So um, are you somehow in contact with, um, I mean, why isn't there some kind of uh, document signed by known security experts to demand access to more of this known material and put it under a certain license and uh, give it to Cryptome, give it to whoever um, needs it. I mean, where is that movement happening? I, I can read it here and there, like your, your statement, Bruce Nile's statement, but it's not coordinated so far. And so your question is not why is it not happening? Yes, it's not it, where you you said where is it happening? Happen, yeah. Why why is it not? The happening? question is why There's not. There's a yeah. reason that it it's also didn't not happen at Transmediale. Happening. We can say that here. I mean, it didn't happen here. Um, you just mentioned that we are too often agreeing with uh, compromises, um, successes of the past, and um, playing with the results and harvesting the possibilities from from what has been achieved already. Um, which is probably not enough. Uh, but but what, what, what would stand in between uh, like a next step when you, when you say, let's get full access to the material? Who's on the other side p protecting that? Inter I mean, well, someone who's um, <clears throat> allegedly inside mm. the Snowden operation mm. <clears throat> yeah. two hours ago said there's got to be a public demand for these things to be released. Mm. They're not going to do it on their own unless the public demands that it yeah. be released. He says, somehow we've got to get that campaign going yeah. because they're not going to do it by themselves. They need more public demand that these things be released. Mm. And that's, I thought that was pretty interesting because the seminar we were in says, oh, we mm. can work with what we've got. We don't need it anymore. They're not listening to people inside who want this stuff out, mm. but they're not going to do it unless the public demands that it, or there be some interest group that demands it. On, on inf information security and 
communication security mail is, there's tremendous amount of discussion about this. They're doing their best to extrapolate from what they've got mm -hmm. and saying, if only we knew this, if we had this tip, we could close the gap. So they're trying to work with what they've got, but saying there's so much missing, we're afraid to make speculations. It says mm -hmm. it's damnable to have only the teasing material and not the full stuff. Mm -hmm. And so they're talking about it, but don't forget, they too have got careers to worry about. So they don't want to go too far out and challenge Mm. Don't forget who's the best customers of Comsec people, the USG. Mm. Mm. So mm. not going and, and, and commerce. And, so they're not going to go too far. So it's going to take those of us who go too far. But to also, push but for in it. terms of the public mm. campaign demanding, of course, as I mentioned earlier, there are campaigns that are resisting. There, there are the the the. Uh, uh, the the national security enthusiasts, mm. grassroots up, who are always pushing for uh, 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 American military prestige in all its dimensions. I have a undergraduate mathematics degree from a college where a professor told me recently NSA actively recruits the mathematicians. It's a women's college. The women mathematicians actively being recruited and NSA informally funding, attempting to fund programs there as they have, you know how many universities they are funding mm -hmm. programs for, you know, emergent cryptographers and so on. So there are vast monies being spent across America in order to build up that constituency contra uh, 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 con contra the sort of campaign that we're looking for. So it's not it's not a cam campaign to occur in a vacuum. There is active resistance in the polity. Yeah, if you go to NSA website, they actually list the colleges that they're funding. <laughs> and there are hundreds. Mm -hmm. So they're not hiding this. It's there, and students are being induced to join this in future career. <clears throat> of course, we there are several million people who have security clearance in the U.S., much less around the world. And so that there's a vast industry in not making this kind of thing public. Mm -hmm. And so long as they get away with it and say it's for the national security, they're just not going to let it go. It's mm -hmm. too lucrative. Now, what do you do about these millions of people who are making their living off of keeping this uh, so-called oath that they're saying Snowden violated? Mm -hmm. uh, and so it's going to be interesting as to uh, people outside this industry opposing those who are on the inside. They are not going to accept this. Their lives are based on it. They've been at it for their whole career. Mm -hmm. And so that uh, it's a good question. Why don't you tell us what you think we should do? I think um, the election is coming. And um, that's probably one of the topics to bring in and um, remind people again what Hillary Clinton is somehow attached with the companies from the military sector, I heard. So, I mean, this, this, these discussions would help to make a better decision, probably, of some of the Democrats who to, to vote, for example. I don't know which documents you could still hold on that to make some kind of connections on, on that level. I think the, for probably from the inner workings of the Democrat Party, there might be some people interested in these issues in a moment. And that Bernie Sanders is not completely out. I think that will be kind of timely right now. And the other thing I think is very important to have, um, let's say if, you, if you're a karate master, yeah, then um, where are the disciples who kind of um, uh, continue with the work, you know, get teached and um, maybe you know Paul, have you ever met Paul Guerin from New York, from Namespace? No? No. Okay. No. Mm -hmm. So he's not a disciple. Yes. But um, that's the hacker community. Um, the, you know, like the first generation, us, me included, Gilmore and, and so on, they're probably not the target anymore to continue um, your work. But that's, I think that's also important to speak about the continuation of uh, this culture we are standing for, um, you know, growing up with the student movements, you know, for me it was uh, late late 80s when I went with the student movement, but it had a relation with uh, 68 or so. So, um, yeah, that's what I'm concerned with in the moment, um, to tell this story. Diana wants to say something? Good. Good. So we will um, have the last words. Diana, you want to ask something? Come on, you're here. 
No, I, just, I actually would love to thank uh, John and Deborah for this discussion and say, yeah, uh, yes, there are lots of things I would love to discuss off the, off the airwaves. Yeah. But of course, I'm always happy when people bring up my dear old friend Mark Rudd on our own radio. So, <laughs> off the record. I, I have to say, you know, that doesn't have to be off the record, but I'm also really happy when, with your question, is in a way like what would you, in a way, ask of coming like com coming generations and so on? How how should they carry on this kind of fight? And what what is that fight? So Great statement, because Deborah's uh, video has a question mark at the end, and that's what we want to say. We are not certain about this. In fact, we think there's more questions than answers, and we don't like people who are too certain. We think it's more important for the public to ask more questions than hear it from us. That's why we don't put our opinions on Krypton. Mm. We don't offer opinions on Krypton. We're, we're out of character in this show. Krypton just gives you documents. You, you decide what you want to do with them. Mm. So you can't broadcast this. <laughs> Well, there is this generational issue now of young people who've grown up digital and the, the digital erotic, which has been part of their erotic lives. It's very difficult to break off that relationship and to become uh, concerned about issues that perhaps their, their elders uh, connected to uh, student movements of uh, previous generations have a more visceral um, experience with of what, tear gas being in the, the jail cell overnight or longer. Mm -hmm. and, and so this, uh, uh, the, the desire that uh, digital life uh, responds to the mirror that mirrors back, you know, these young people's desire. It's it's it'll be it's it's a, a very interesting to actually now track generationally how these issues, um, uh, how younger generations are connecting with these issues. And you mentioned upcoming conferences. I mean, I. I'm curious to hear from very young people mm -hmm. on these matters, not yeah. us. Exactly. You know, we're too, we're all too old at this point. We want to hear from very young, uh, politically uh, ambivalent people on these matters. Yes, I totally agree. <laughs> and probably also from people in Turkey, from people yeah, in, in other... Enough about Snowden. Yeah. We heard a wonderful talk today by a woman who talked about all sorts of interesting things and never mentioned the word Snowden. <laughs> that was great to hear because we think it's overdone. Yeah. There are hundreds of issues that crypto publishes on that has yeah. nothing to do with Snowden that are probably more important. And so this exaggerated importance of Snowden is almost a hipster type thing. <laughs> and uh, it needs to be toned down because there's, there's, money, there's very serious stuff that needs to be dealt with and the Snowden issue is not a really worthwhile issue anymore. It's been done to death. I totally agree. That's why we are going now to the concert of um, Serhat Koksa. He's part of the anti-Erdogan movement in Turkey, Istanbul, and uh, they're kind of trying to um, bring up the stories about the uh, and the, where the civil war is happening against the Kurds and a lot of crimes against humanity happening on you know, Europe, European uh, within the European borders, so to say. And um, not being mentioned often enough. Okay, I'm switching over. Thank you, John Young, Deborah Natsios from Cryptome Org. Thank, Thank you. You. Ooh. you. You can edit this, of course. Gözel Radio.